even though we've battled the heat, drought, insects, and failure, we keep going. Sure, our resolve has been tested near daily, but now more than ever, we're determined to keep going. Despite all these challenges, the harvests are still coming in. Berries, bulbs, leafy goodness, as well as those garden staples have all been on the menu this summer. Every year sees its share of ups and downs, so nothing has really surprised us. However, now more than ever, it feels like the fundamentals and basics of cultivating crops is even more crucial to our continued success. A success that I hope you guys are experiencing as well. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to Volume 21 of the Garden Quickie, the show where we try to facilitate gardening success at every corner quickly. Hey, in case you missed it, here's episodes 201 to 210. Enjoy. As far as raw root vegetables go, there's nothing as sweet and crunchy as a freshly picked carrot from your own backyard. It's great because at 50 to 70 days from seed to harvest, you can plant carrots multiple times a year. But how do we know when it's the right time to harvest them? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we do everything but pick the carrots for you. And today's episode is all about those carrots. More specifically, three things that tell us that this root vegetable is ready to pull up. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Of the four main categories of carrots grown, Chantenay, Danvers, Imperator, and Nantes, nearly all available to the home grower are less than an 80 day crop. Cooler weather can slow them down, however, which is why an average harvest range is often given. And that brings us to our first indicator that our carrots are ready to harvest, which is the information given on the back of every seed packet. Every retail packet of seeds you buy will have the days to harvest, usually on the back with the planting information. Climate and weather are no doubt going to mess with this number every year, and it's our least accurate way to tell when carrots are ready. Still though, it does give us a guideline. Better still is our second way to tell when our carrots are ready to pull up, and that's when the carrot shoulders start to appear. Now, the shoulders of the plant are where those green stems meet the developing taproot, the carrot. And as carrots mature, those shoulders tend to push their way above the soil. If you see this, quite likely your carrots will be ready soon if they're not already. And finally, the most accurate way to tell when a carrot is ready to pull up is back to those shoulders. This time though, focusing on the size and the color of them. For starters, as soon as the skin of a carrot turns to its adult color, regardless of size, you can pull it up and eat it. In fact, there's nothing as sweet and tasty as a true baby carrot right from your garden. A treat for all ages. But for your carrots to reach true maturity and thus maximum yield, we have to couple that color with the size of the shoulders. For most varieties, when that shoulder thickness has reached three quarters to one inch thick in diameter, you know that the carrots are ready to pull up. Using the first two strategies as guidelines, along with this shoulder method, is the most accurate way to tell that your carrots are ready to harvest. Carrots are totally awesome. Almost as awesome as checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. It feels like it's been forever. It really does. I mean, come on. Is it finally time to harvest our garlic yet? Reminiscent of the kids in the back seat of the car screaming, Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Waiting for that annual garlic harvest is the true test of gardening patience. But for how long this crop takes to grow, the window to harvest it properly is surprisingly short. 
Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, garlic is our game. And today's episode is all about that favorite allium. More specifically, when is the right time to harvest our garlic? Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Many people say that one month after you cut the scapes off, your garlic should be ready to harvest. Well, that doesn't really help the soft net growers whose garlic bulb doesn't produce this flowering appendage, nor is it really all that accurate. Others will tell you to always harvest your garlic in the month of June. That's fine if you live in an area where the climate and weather never change and you plant the same variety of garlic in the same spot every year. Obviously, this is also highly inaccurate. I mean, it's July now and I'm still not ready to harvest my garlic. Of course, we can brush some mulch and soil aside to take a peek at the bulbs, which tend to grow right at the surface. Which will tell us if the bulbs are big enough. And if they are, then that's great, because one of the last things a garlic plant does is to bulk up its bulb. But still, that doesn't tell us when it's time to harvest. The only surefire way to tell that your garlic is ready to harvest when one half to two thirds of the lower leaves of the plant have dried up and turn brown. You see, garlic, like its cousin the onion, is made up of many layers. And it's the few sets of dried up lower leaves that gives the garlic bulbs its papery protection to allow for maximum storage. Pick too late and the garlic bulbs, as well as the individual cloves, burst through that papery protection, making storing almost impossible. However, pick too early and the plant won't have created that papery protection in the first place. A small but critical window of time that you don't want to miss. Kind of like the next episode of the Garden Quickie. No doubt summer is here and the heat has finally arrived. And with it comes incredible growth. Water, light, and of course that heat is what our plants have been waiting for. Unfortunately, there's a darker side to heat, and that's keeping our plants properly hydrated. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we keep you and your plants fresh all summer long. And today's episode is all about watering plants. Specifically, three ways to keep your crops healthy, happy, and hydrated this summer. Hey. Time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Plants use water for literally every daily life function. And without enough of it on the hottest days of summer, our plants simply won't grow or even survive. But it's not simply a case of just watering every day. We can't do that. While sometimes it does indeed come to that, when and how we water can have a much greater positive impact. Which brings us to our first tip, and that's to always water in the morning. We do this for two reasons. One, much less water is lost due to evaporation, simply because the soil and the surrounding areas are still cool from the previous evening. Two, it also allows our plants to hydrate and uptake all that water to fortify themselves before the heat of the day hits. This is huge in times of extreme heat. Water in the morning. It's more efficient and it's more useful. Literally double the effect. Our second watering tip to get you through the heat of summer is to water more thoroughly, but less often. It's not because our crops need less water. It's because when you water more frequently, you train the plant's roots to stay at the surface. Why go searching for moisture if the available water is only ever in the top two inches of topsoil? Shallow, frequent waterings leads to weak rooted plants that are infinitely more susceptible to heat and drought. Water more when you do, but do it less. And our third and final summer watering tip is for you container growers, which is to water from below. Pots and containers inherently drain better and shed excess water more efficiently. Great most of the time, 
except during the heat of the summer. Watering from below for a few hours every other day allows your plants to soak up as much moisture as they need to battle the heat. And they do this without losing all of those nutrients and goodness within the soil, like with traditional overhead watering. Simple, easy, and it pays dividends right away. Just like making sure to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Tomatoes are impressive plants, growing to new heights seemingly in real time right before our eyes. And because of this, our vine type indeterminate tomatoes need our support to look and perform their best. Growing these beauties vertically is the only way to guarantee their success. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie. The show where in two minutes or less, we support you and your tomatoes. And today's episode is going to be all about those tomatoes. More specifically, three ways to trellis your vine tomatoes so that they can grow to their full potential. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. As we've discussed in previous videos, there are two main categories of tomatoes. Determinate, or bush type and indeterminate, or vine type. While determinate varieties most certainly benefit from staking and support, we're going to be focusing on the vine type of tomatoes today. And so the first way for us to support our tomato plants is by using a simple single stake. Basically, a pole or long piece of wood is staked vertically into the ground right beside the main stem of your tomato plant. Ideally, you do this at the time of planting, or even before if possible, but today we don't have that luxury. Of our three ways to support your tomato plants, this is the most basic. Still though, highly effective. The second way that we're covering here today is to use what's called tomato cages. These are normally store-bought aluminum, or sometimes steel, wire contraptions that are even more crude than the simple steak. They can work well for the determinate or bush type tomatoes, yes, but for our vine varieties, they're often too small. Modifications or add-ons like my dad has done here for my mom's tomatoes can work well in a pinch though. Don't be shy to use your creativity. The tomatoes won't mind. And our third way to trellis large indeterminate types of tomatoes is by constructing an actual trellis using string rope or something like this wire here. Whatever material you choose to use, it's basically suspended vertically, sometimes eight feet or more by a more permanent structure. The tomatoes are then attached to these vertical lines incrementally as they grow up. For me, I've always just used twist ties with great success, but you can use string, yarn, straps, or even those tomato clips. In fact, I wanna try using some of these Velcro strips this year for the first time. Thin wire or even fishing line can cut into your tomato plants, especially on windy days when those stalks move back and forth, so they should be avoided. For most of the indeterminate types that I grow, I secure my tomato plants about six inches from the base, and then again, every two to three nodes. Do note that you always want to tie your tomato plants up directly above a node and never directly below, as that will most likely become a point of failure. I've seen more than one tomato plant stem snap right in half because it was tied up directly below the node. It sounds like a simple thing, but it's really important. Other than that, there's nothing left to do but sit and wait for some delicious tomatoes. And while we do, check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. I know it's hard to believe, but summer's only just started. And already our plants are feeling the heat. Of course in these conditions we water diligently, but sometimes even that isn't enough. There has to be a better way. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie. The show where in two minutes or less, we're all about finding a better way.
And today's episode is all about beating the summer heat. Specifically, three things that we can do to conserve moisture and make our waterings more efficient. Time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Even if we follow the strict guidelines of watering in the morning, watering thoroughly, and watering less frequently, in this kind of heat, it's still not enough to keep our plants healthy and happy. Truly, it's not about watering more, it's about creating the right growing environment. Evaporation is the enemy here, and if we can solve or even limit it, then we stand a fighting chance. And the easiest, most effective way to do this is to mulch. It's no secret that bare soil loses water faster than we can add it. So, let's cover it up. A nice, thick, organic mulch layer is going to lock in that valuable moisture, limit evaporation, and create a scenario where summer is a time for extreme growth rather than drying up and dying. Another way to cover up that soil if you know that the summer is going to be a scorcher is to plant your crops closer together. Again, we're covering up and limiting that bare soil. Shade it as much as possible and take evaporation out of the equation. It's not always ideal, but when it works, it works. And our third and final summer heat strategy is to tackle moisture from the ground up. And we do that by focusing on retention. The single most effective way to do this is to up the organic content of our soils. Sandy, inorganic soils drain water like crazy and retain little to no moisture. If we're looking to lose 50% of our moisture to heat and evaporation alone, then retaining more moisture in the first place is going to be a difference maker. Simply add organic matter in the form of compost every time you plant. And after you're done, make sure to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. As if being easy to grow, prolific, and delicious weren't enough, peas are also self-sustaining. Of course not in the sense that they're perennials that come back to life every spring, but they do manage to live on, provided we do a few simple things. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're all about the simple things. And today's episode is all about those peas. More specifically, saving their seeds so that you can plant them again. Hey, time's short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Peas come in three basic types. English, snap, and snow. Saving their seeds to grow a new crop of them is the exact same for all the varieties. Today though, all of our examples are going to be with the snow types, because that's mostly what I grow. And that brings us to the first step in saving pea seeds, or really any vegetable seeds at all, and that's choosing the right variety. And by that, I mean only collecting the seeds from open pollinated pea types. That way you can ensure that the seeds you collect will breed true and give you the exact same type of harvest every time you plant them. All peas are self-pollinating and they tend not to crossbreed with each other. So don't worry if you have multiple varieties planted. The only thing you gotta worry about is making sure that they're open pollinated. For the actual seed collection, this one is all about patience. It may seem like these snow peas are ready to collect, being well past their harvest date and all swollen like this. But like most seed saving with virtually all the crops we grow, you gotta wait until they're fully ready. And for peas, that means we have to wait until they're completely dried out. It's not until the pods are dry, crackly, and the pea seeds actually rattle around inside that they're ready to collect. Once they are though, pick the pods off the vine and simply pop the seeds out and store them in a cool dry place for up to three to five years. 
Simple stuff, yes, but an incredibly powerful skill to add to your self-sufficient arsenal. Much like watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Over the years, I've grown a lot of garlic. And I do mean a lot. 20 plus years of garlic growing, planting 200 to 400 bulbs each time tends to add up. Always the same way though. Individual cloves planted in the fall, overwintered in the ground, and then harvested the following summer. Which leads me to wonder, is there possibly a better way? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, if it's possible, we'll find that better way. And today's episode is all about that garlic. More specifically, why is it always grown from cloves and never from seed? Time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Okay, right off the bat, let me say this. Garlic isn't grown from seed because it's hard, it takes too long, and sometimes it's not even possible. Let me explain that last one. Garlic, over the years, thousands of years, has been cultivated and selectively bred for larger and larger bulbs, all at the expense of its ability to flower and produce seeds. As a result of this intense man-made selection over the years, virtually all the garlic cultivated around the world is essentially sterile. True, the hardneck types will produce a flower, and pretty reliably, but that doesn't mean that those flowers are going to produce viable seeds. As a response to this, and because nature always finds a way, garlic has developed the ability to grow young plants in place of those seeds. These amazing inventions are called bulbils or bulblets and are basically full seeds that are identical clones of the main plant. New garlic can be grown from these bulbils, yes, but just like with the seed, it adds a significant amount of time to an already incredibly long crop. In the rare instance that true garlic seed is obtained, it's a full two year process to get an actual bulb harvest from them. For something that grows so easily and so readily vegetatively, albeit over a long period of time, growing from seeds just isn't worth it. You know what is worth it though? Making sure to check out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. There's no question that onion flowers are beautiful, magical even, and almost every time I see them, I smile. Almost. You see, as an onion grower, the last thing that I want to see is these plants blooming. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, flowers aside, we're absolutely obsessed with onions. And today's episode is all about them. More specifically, why are onion flowers so bad when you're trying to grow them? Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. A good majority of our favorite crops harvests come from their ability to flower. Tomatoes, peppers, peas, and of course these blueberries here. Onions flower too, but it's actually something we don't want them to do. Let me explain. As a biennial plant, onions enter into a flowering cycle when their second year is signaled. Broken down and simplified, it looks like this. After an initial season of growth, then a winter rest, followed by another season of growth, that's when onions are supposed to be flowering. The bulb that we're after is produced in that first growing season, so normally we don't even see a flowering cycle. However, onions grown from sets or even those grown from seeds that face hardships or poor timing on our part, can be triggered prematurely into a flowering cycle. Why is that so bad though? Well, 
It's bad because an onion that's gone to flower will abandon making or forming that bulb, putting all of its energy into the flower. Boom, we just lost the harvest. What we haven't lost though, are these few container white onions here and the ability to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. It's amazing when our crops go the extra mile and reproduce in such a way that we'll literally never be without. And green onions have to be the absolute king of this. Giant flower heads filled with thousands of black seeds, each one capable of becoming a brand new green onion plant. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we're absolutely wild about green onions. And today's episode is all about them. More specifically, how to grow and collect green onion seeds so that you have an unlimited supply. Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. It's quite something when a plant grows so easily that you can harvest it, cut it up, replant just the root section, and regrow it into an entirely new crop. Now, that's fine for a single stalk, yes, but if we want complete green onion madness, well, we've got to collect the seeds. Green onions readily flower? That's not the problem. The issue is, they only do it in their second year. You see, like all alliums, green onions are biennial plants. That means they need a season of growth, followed by a winter dormancy, followed by a flowering cycle in the second season of growing. Now, if you've been growing your green onions from store-bought cuttings, they may indeed flower in the first year but it's not guaranteed. Either way, you've finally got your green onions to flower. What do we do next? Well, like all allium flowers, they are self-pollinating. Unfortunately, they're not very good at it. Insect help is going to be required to get the volume of seeds we're after. And not just a few times either. Green onion flowers last a really long time upwards of a month or more, and we definitely don't want to be cutting those flowers off too early. In fact, you don't need to cut them off at all. Once dried and fully mature, the seed heads turn brown and open up, revealing all those tiny black seeds inside. At this point, simply shake them off into an empty container for the easiest seed collection ever. Store your green onion seeds in a cool, dark, dry place just like you would with any other crop. The kicker is though, green onion seeds are relatively short-lived. They say one to two years for max viability, although I've gone three years without a problem. Still though, this is going to be a frequent process to get a reliable supply of seeds. Good thing it's so easy. Almost as easy as checking out the next episode, of the Garden Quickie. Surely the garlic harvest has to be one of the best highlights of the gardening season. It's exciting, rewarding, and if I got to admit, it's a bit of a relief. It took a long time to get to this part, especially for us northern hardneck growers, but you know what? The growing isn't quite done yet. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, the growing is never done. And today's episode is all about that growing. More specifically, what crops do we have time to plant immediately after harvesting our garlic? I got eight of them for you today, but as you know, time is in short supply, so let's dive in. When we harvest hard neck garlic after nine long months of growing, amazingly, there's still a couple of months to plant more crops. Whether it's next year's garlic going back in or something completely new, we've got at least a couple of months until the cold weather hits. 
The beauty of planting right now is that it's warm out, so the seeds are going to germinate fast and the seedlings are going to grow even faster. But even more important than that, the temperatures are on their way down and that's going to allow us to escape this brutal summer heat come harvest time. The crops on this list are picked because of two qualities. One, they grow fast in this relatively short window and two, they love to be harvested in the cool weather. And that brings us to the first crop on our list, which is peas. Almost always direct seeded, these guys are a 60 to 70 day crop and they take the cold like a champ. Grown in the ground or in containers, make sure to give these guys support as they love to climb. At number two, we've got carrots. While these guys have been problematic this summer for me due to all that heat, I'm really looking forward to growing them in the cooler weather. Summer planting for that fall harvest has always been the best way for me to grow carrots. I have no doubt that my harvests of this delicious root crop will double as the temperatures decrease over the next few months. Same thing with these beads. Honestly, with all the heat and drought we've had this summer, it's been near impossible to keep these guys hydrated to allow them to bulb up. Honestly, when it comes to root crops, fall harvesting is where it's at. One crop that is most definitely affected by the summer heat is lettuce. Grown by either transplants or direct seeding, plant your lettuce now to enjoy sweeter, crispier leaves as the summer heat subsides. This next one could most likely be planted twice, even in our short window, we're talking radishes. One of the quickest crops you'll ever grow, seed to harvest in just 30 days. Amazing. Another easy and fast one is green onions. Grown from either seed or cuttings, green onions are the gift that keeps on giving. Plant these guys once, let them go to seed, and literally never buy green onions again. And as a bonus, they're quite cold tolerant, so we can enjoy them year round. At number seven, we've got spinach. This crop can match radishes for speed, and as a leaf only harvest, sometimes it's even faster. Direct seed these guys now for delicious spinach leaves in about a month. And finally, the last plant on our list are the brassicas, like this dinosaur kale here who just can't wait for summer to be over. This is the group of plants that includes cauliflower, broccoli, kale, cabbage, and of course Brussels sprouts. These guys are literally designed to be planted right now, so the timing works out perfectly. Best grown from transplants, you can buy brassica starters at the store, or you can simply make your own at home for a far greater variety at a fraction of the cost. Timing really is the key for these guys and the gradually cooling temperatures at this time of the year makes brassicas and the other seven plants on this list an easy choice for planting. Almost as easy as checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, make sure to subscribe and click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.